Hey everybody, it's your friendly neighborhood dandelion here. I just wanted to introduce you all to Kingdom Hearts Insider Off the Chain. Hopefully this is the first episode in a series of many interviews that we do, where we talk off the cuff with people who have been involved with Kingdom Hearts in various ways over the years. Hope you guys enjoy our first interview with Seth Kearsley. Hey everybody, this is PJ, aka Tenny, aka Dandelion, aka the annoying guy that shuts all of your threads on the forums. And I have a very special guest with me here today. Uh, we are doing one of our first ever off the cuff, hashtag off the chain interviews. Um, our special guest directed the Adam Sandler animated feature Eight Crazy Nights. And some more of his animation credits include Dilbert, Phineas and Ferb, Looney Tunes Show, Family Guy, The Simpsons. He storyboarded my favorite episode of Bob's Burgers, Art Crawl. And more recently, he's worked on Secret Life of Pets and Sing, just to name a few. And in the early 2000s, he worked with Disney to direct a pilot for a potential Kingdom Hearts animated series. So everyone, please welcome Seth Kearsley. Thank you so much for joining me today. Good to be here. Yeah, I was expecting like an applause, but there's only two of us and our (laughs) producer friend Rob. But here, I'll add it it in post. I didn't have the applause ready, I'm sorry. Absolutely. Where's your soundboard, Rob? <laughs> you had one job. I thought this was a morning radio show. Uh, it is. It's morning somewhere. Uh, so it's super. It's super great to actually get to talk to you. We've been emailing for a little bit, and I thought it would be great to just get just get some some facts out there, get the interview yep. going, um, tell people things that they probably didn't already know, but also to kind of quell expectations for what's going on. Um, so before we get to all of that good stuff, I want to talk a little bit about your background and where you come from and all the good animation backstory for me. You were born in Cincinnati, but I think you said that you grew up in California. Yeah, my parents moved um, to Ventura when I was six. I, you know, I mean, I still have memories of Ohio, and my mom still lives in Ohio. My dad and my stepmom moved out here, um, so uh, I have been back many times. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, well. That's where I am now. And, and then I actually spent a couple summers in, in Columbus building decks and fences to help fund paying to go to CalArts. Oh man! Well, I guess you gotta get you gotta get that CalArts money somehow. Yeah. Um, can you hear the uh, the lawnmower? It's not too bad. Uh, okay. Just yeah, for you know, for everyone listening at home, there's a gardener. Well, I mean, it's it, whatever. We'll deal with it. It's, it's, it's a very small patch of grass, and it doesn't really need to be mowed, um, <laughs> so it'll be done quickly. Um, oh. And uh, leave lots of divots in the grass where they turn the the mower little divots of grass was the name of my willie nelson cover band in college (laughs) um so growing up were you an animation fan because i know that probably in your early years it's hard to find people who kind of facilitate and foster interest in the arts in southern ohio at least in my experience anyway I mean, yeah, I was always into animation, um, and, you know, I think that The Simpsons started when I was, um, I want to say when I was in junior high or something like that, and I had always been watching cartoons, and then there was, like, a brief moment where I wasn't, but then The Simpsons was prime time, so then it was, like, it was okay to watch cartoons again. Right. Um, And um, as a kid, I remember um, we had a Super 8 movie projector that had no sound, and And we used to watch um, old uh, Disney shorts, um, you know, on film, projecting them, do the voices and make up (laughs) our own stories and stuff like that. I'll dovetail that into Kingdom Hearts stuff, um, because um, (laughs) one of the shorts that I remember was my favorite um, was uh, this one called Clock Cleaners. Yeah. If you've seen that. Um, Absolutely. And uh, Goofy gets knocked out um, and, and then is like you know, all over the place, um, you know, wreaking havoc. And so that was something that I, I did in the pilot um, where uh, <laughs> I had Goofy get knocked out and then he's just like, you know, um, you do a pretty good Goofy. Well, he was my favorite character. Uh, so he was knocked out and then like swinging his shield and stuff and, you know, knocking Heartless out and, and like that, <laughs> you know, while Sora was, you know, doing awesome stuff with the Keyblade and um, and Donald was doing magic stuff. So. I love that clock cleaners uh, influence. I definitely think the Kingdom Hearts series needs more of that slapstick animation reference because it had some in the first game. But as the series has gone along, the Donald and Goofy aren't as rubbery as they are in the animation, if that makes sense. Did, did they get serious? They don't get well, kind of, but they're not like sometimes serious stuff happens, but sometimes they do. I mean, it's a pretty stuff. serious story. Like, worlds are disappearing. Um, yeah. So. 
<laughs> Everyone's going to be disappointed that I don't know anything beyond the first game, <laughs> except, uh, for what you, except for what you've told me. Well, that's what I'm here for. Well, and then I saw something. I saw something um, the other day where someone had graphed out like the whole Kingdom Hearts universe from oh, no. the beginning to, and it looked like when you see like the um, the Marvel universe projection for the films for the next you know ten years or whatever. <laughs> it I was is like, exactly oh my like that. God, seriously, has there been that much? It, it's exactly like that. Plus, there are various forms of of media reinterpretations. So there are like there are books, there are comics, uh. there have been like other games on different uh, consoles. It's it's all over the place, um, yeah. and the timeline is not linear. It jumps back and forth, hundreds uh. of years in the past, ten years in the past, a couple years in the future. Um, it's crazy. Kingdom Hearts one, two, and three. Those are like the core ones, right? Essentially, um, the Kingdom Hearts, when they do numbered titles, those titles kind of spin off their own arcs with uh-huh. like side characters and, and bridge chapters in between. So one and two and three all have Sora as the main character and they all happen sequentially. Um, uh-huh. But everything that happens between them kind of hops back and forth to flesh out the world. Is three yeah. the only one that Nomura does? No, he's directed all of them. Oh, OK. I yeah, he's got his little thumbprint all over. Uh, huh. as a as a layman and not really uh, a gamer, more of a of a a nerd in general, uh, is Kingdom Hearts? Do you, is do you think that the story is completely established? Like, are they working towards an end, or uh, kind of like Star Wars was you know predetermined, or are mm. they adding, you know? No, yes and no. He makes it up as he goes along to a certain extent. So he had some ideas, but no one knew the success of the games. And you also have to kind of take into consideration that this was in the early 2000s when Disney was... I mean, they were still Disney, but they were undergoing a lot of of changes in management and the ways that they did their animation and the ways that they ran their company and the ways that they handled everything. Things were all up in the air, and I think that watching how the animation world has changed and how Disney has been forced to either adapt or to renovate itself has always been interesting, regardless of who's been in charge um, throughout since the beginning of animation's history. So that, that kind of leads me into your influences and how they shaped who you are as an artist and how you got into actually doing animation professionally. Hmm. Um, Ooh, that was loaded. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's not loaded. It's, it's potentially a lot of stuff. That's I'm fine. ramping my brain up for lots of words to come out. Um, <laughs> uh, influence as an artist. Um, I mean, I was really, um, like, from really young, um, more uh, influenced by, like, you know, people like Frazetta or, like, um, Escher. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I always draw, like, drew kind of like bizarro things um and um like muscly guys and, and bizarro things um, same muscly guys that are all on stairs that all lead in different directions and and have different gravity um you know that that sort of thing so animation wise um i remember robotech was a was a huge thing for me um and uh, like i didn't i didn't get why robotech was different than all of the other shows that i was watching like i didn't I didn't know anything about how animation was done. And so I didn't get that, like those were Japanese um, shows. I just thought that like that my local TV station made those shows. Um, I was always having my parents tell me like, you should do something with your art. But, but then like they never uh, showed me anything about what you could do with art um, or like the different kinds of jobs that you could get in art. And uh, so all I knew of artists were like, you know, dead artists who died penniless and, you know, lopped off ears and (laughs) things like that. And I never really thought about like that, that comic books, like someone pays someone to do those things. Um, And, and I never thought about with animation that someone pays someone to do uh, those things. Um, My path was basically, I was going to going to, uh, build houses with my dad and I was just going to, you know, be in construction and, and like that. And then, um, I had a friend who went to Cal arts, uh, and he was a couple years ahead of me. And so I went out for some of the parties, um, and the parties were insane. And I was like, I have to go to this school 
because these <laughs> parties are insane. And then I, I kind of, you know, as like drunk party goer would wander around the animation department. There was something about it that felt like I belonged there. Like it felt like the, it was like a whole department of people like me. And I remember uh, hearing this beeping sound uh, and, and I followed the beeping sound to uh, what turned out to be the camera room. Um, and it was someone shooting their film. Sorry, drink of water. You can edit that out. Uh, <laughs> that that wasn't uh, for dramatic effect. I'm I'm totally buzzed. I'm watching this guy shoot his film. He doesn't even know I'm there because he's so engrossed in you know uh, putting one sheet of paper down and taking a you know two frames. And uh, he was shooting onto three quarter inch uh, tape. Um, you know, high tech stuff. So the three quarter inch tape rolls back five seconds before it comes and then takes another couple of frames. So I was watching his film. Um, one frame at a time in five second chunks. And it was the first time that I ever saw like rough animation. And, and it was like, oh, oh, I get it now. It's kind of like a flip book. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of like where the hook got set. Um, and the guy who was shooting his, his film, because uh, I remember he had a weird name, but he was doing a film about um, a grumpy old guy with a square head. Um, and a little girl with a round head whose balloon gets stuck in a tree. Um, <laughs> it was uh, Pete Doctor. Oh. I, I heard there's a thing that one didn't cover me, but it couldn't have been more perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, that's someone texting me. Oh, uh, see, Rob, he has a soundboard. Better <laughs> you. I, I think that's really cool. It sounded kind of like you had like a white rabbit experience where you just kind of got. Yeah, kind of was. It. It was like a, the Matrix White Rabbit experience where I was drunk and, you know, who knows who put what in my beer. And um, <laughs> and so I was like, I got to I got to do this. I got to come to the school. Um, and um, so my senior year of high school, I went out and talked to the counselor and he was like, no, you're not getting into the school. Um, <laughs> it's like you need to work on this and this and this and this and this um, and, you know, come back when when you're better. And so uh, it just happened that that year um, we were in a really severe drought we were actually it was like the seventh year of drought um, and in Ventura they had stopped issuing building permits uh, if you're if you were pulling a permit for anything that involved plumbing it was on hold and so my dad's business basically died with the drought uh, oh. and he moved back to Ohio because his mom was uh, you know elderly and needed um, care and, and like that and so I stayed in Ventura, um, and I lived in a one-car garage um, that uh, my dad dropped me off at um, that had um, a stack of drywall and some drywall mud and some tools um, in the middle of the, the garage. Um, and so I, like, insulated and drywalled and, you know, finished off the garage for myself while I was living there. Um, and the whole idea was that I was just going to focus – all my energy on working on my portfolio um, and uh, I took nothing but art classes at the um, the community college in Ventura um, and um, and like I just uh, every every waking moment I was drawing um, and I was doing the things that the um, the instructor had told me to do or not the instructor the guidance counselor guy at CalArts um, and um, and then I went back out almost a year later um, and I met with the dean of the animation school, um, and uh, I'd never seen um, someone flip through your work before that wasn't like a family member or a friend, you know? Right. Um, and so when, when you're getting a professional portfolio reviewed, like the pages turn as fast as they can turn them because they're seeing what they need to see in as soon as they look at it, um, like in a, in a second. They, they know what they need to need to see. Um, and, uh, so I was just thinking like, oh, I'm blowing and I'm blowing and I'm blowing. This, this, this is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, and, um, uh, so I just started rattling off, um, you know, this like stream of consciousness, you know, verbal diarrhea, um, and, um, you know, told him about how, like, I was living in this one car garage and it was me and my brother and like three other guys and, you know, we were um, living off of day old donuts um, and handouts from, you know, a friend who worked at Panda Express uh, and uh, I was shoplifting cans of tuna to eat and art supplies. I look back and if I heard someone tell me that they wanted to do this thing so bad that they put themselves through that for an entire year just to get into the school, I would totally let them in, too. 
Um, and uh, so he filled out the the acceptance form in front of me, and and I thought that he was um, like moving on with you know the business that he had to do, and was just humoring me that he was still that he hadn't thrown me out of his office yet. Um, but uh, but he accepted me on the spot, and and then I was like, uh, how how much does this school cost? Oh. Um, and uh, it's really expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my parents couldn't help. Um, and so uh, that's when I moved back to Ohio and built decks and fences with my dad in a in this sweltering Ohio uh, inferno of humidity. Yeah. Tell me about it. And and I was able to save up enough money for like my first semester um, and and kind of all along with every step. It was like if I totally like just suck at this and and um, never get any further than this at least i will have done this and then i'll, I'll go back and do construction um at least i gave it a shot um, right so yeah i uh, i ended up making it through at cal arts had uh, a lot of stiff competition uh, while i was there mark andrews was in the class um, just ahead of me um gindy tartakovsky and craig mccracken were in the class just ahead of me oh um, yeah wow uh, Jeff Ranjo, who's um, one of the heads of story at Disney, um, was in my class, and like he had already been through a four-year art program and was just coming back to learn animation, which is the way it was for a lot of uh, the people there. Like some of them had already been working professionally in comics and right. you know, coming to Cal Arts to learn animation. Um, so uh, um, I was. I was one of the youngest in, in my class uh, and I thought like, you know, they're way more talented than I am. Um, so, uh, I better sit at my desk and draw twice as long. Um, cause I've got catching up to do. I think that's kind of comforting in a way to, well, I'm just going to use me as an example. You know, I draw and I doodle and I like to do art, but I don't consider myself a professional in any sense of the word. I don't think I'd ever be ready to like, have you ever um, been paid for art? Yes. Then you are a professional artist. <laughs> Thank sure. you for telling um, him that. Well, not not to the extent where I consider myself ready to apply for like a storyboard um, artist position at a major network. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that um, for people like like me who are in that kind of in between phase of their life where they feel like a really heavy sense of like imposter syndrome whenever mm-hmm. they're in a situation where they can do something professionally or they are faced with the concept of reaching for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that's that's really comforting in a way because you obviously you are talented and you are a hard worker and you did what you had to to get to that point. But even then, you know, to have those kinds of alumni in your class, which yeah. of course they weren't them at that point, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's comforting to to hear that everybody kind of goes through that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of the guys that at, uh, when I got to when I got to school and there were guys that like not only did they know of these guys called the nine old men, but like they knew all of their names and like all of their history. And they could tell you which one of them animated, which scenes in, in which movies. Um, and I was like, who, who are the nine old men? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, I, I, I had a lot of uh, learning to do, but I mean, I also learned a lot from all those guys like, um, you know, Mark Andrews uh, and his brother, Brian, uh, who Brian storyboards um, every action sequence. No, not every, I'm exaggerating, but um, he does the action sequences in like the Avengers and Hulk and um, like that. Just unbelievably talented guys. Um, and they were the ones that really introduced me to, um, you know, in depth to Miyazaki because um, I had seen like some some books, but I'd never really seen the movies. Um and I think that if you look like if you look at a still of a Miyazaki movie, um, it's not as powerful as watching uh, a scene. So yeah, we'd have these um, late night. There was a laser disc player in in the animation department, um, and uh, there were there were a lot of very rich kids that went to the school who had <laughs> like ginormous laser disc collections um and uh, i was not one of those kids um, and that was way back before that was when vhs's were like the yeah, norm no one like... had laser discs yeah no one had laser discs but like some of these guys they had like every movie that you'd want to watch and this is at at school in their dorm room they've got all of these laser discs like i had ramen in my dorm room <laughs> uh, 
uh, we'd watch these movies until like two or three in the morning and um and it like really seeped in and at school i thought like yeah this is wow we're gonna be able to do this this is awesome i didn't really give a lot of thought to going to disney um because i just thought like we're all just gonna leave here and we're just gonna make our own films that's just how like that they're teaching us how to make films and we're just gonna go make films and uh when it came to like finding work after school there was a flyer for the max for mtv um and uh, I was a huge fan of Sam Keith's Wolverine. And uh, and so I hadn't even seen the Max, but um, but I saw that it was Sam Keith. And I was like, oh, I love that dude. A bunch of us went down and, um, you know, got hired kind of on the spot to, to work on it. Um, and uh, and we were just like, this is it. We're going to work. We're just going to work on really cool shit from now on. Like, that's it. Because it seemed that way. Like, you know, MTV was doing the Max and they were doing Eon Flux. Um, and there mm-hmm. was talk of Spawn. Um, there was going to be a bunch of really awesome animation on American television. And then uh, I think it was like, as we were doing the Max, I, I want to say that um, Invasion America came out. Do you even know about this thing? I do not. I mean, it doesn't ring any bells, but... It was a Steven Spielberg Presents kind of a kind of a thing. Um, and it was a it was a prime time sci fi um, action animated um, thing, and uh, they had crazy huge budget, and it looked like shit. And so then that came out, and, and it didn't do anything. Um, and and everyone's like, well, if Steven Spielberg can't make it work for prime time, then no one can. And then it was like it, it all kind of went away. Like you know, Spawn still got made, um, the Max didn't get picked up, Beyond Flux didn't get picked up, and then the only thing there was in prime time was was still just the Sim. And I don't think King of the Hill hadn't started yet. So after the Max, I went on to uh, The Simpsons. I was on season seven. Um, that's how long ago it was. Oh, my goodness. I think they're on season 59 now. But how cool is that, though, that that was like something that you watched when you were in high school yeah. you're high and then got to work on it? Yeah, it was my second job. Um, and everyone, like all my friends at, at, uh, in Ventura were like, holy shit, Seth made it. He's working on The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, like, a year later when I was like, yeah, I'm going to move on, uh, they're like, oh, what are you doing? Are you kidding me? You don't leave a job. But I really wanted to direct. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't going to get the opportunity to direct at The Simpsons. Um, uh, not for, you know, 10 years, maybe. Right. Um, uh, there were there were way too many people that were uh, in line ahead of me. So I, I went from The Simpsons to Disney. Um, uh, I worked on the Timon and Pumbaa thing. And then... Um, I did a development, I, I pitched a show at Disney and everyone was like, well, you, if you're going to pitch a show, you should get an agent. And so I got an agent, uh, just cause I was like, who's your agent? All right, I'll have them as my agent. <laughs> I didn't realize that it was hard to get an agent. It's just at the time, um, it seemed like anything was uh, possible. And the agent sent me out for the show, um, called mummies, um, that was later turned into mummies alive. I had never directed before. Um, I had only been a storyboard artist you know, uh, sporadically, I was mostly doing character layout, which is kind of like the, the key poses of the scenes. Um, and so mummies was at Deke, uh, the, the guy who was interviewing me, uh, outlined this hell schedule. I was like, well, what do you think? Can you do it? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Totally. You know, like it was no big deal. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I got the job and I was like, Oh, I lied. I lied so I, hard. How do I do this? But, you know, like I, I mentioned it to like, you know, some friends, um, uh, you know, that were at Disney who had been in the industry for a lot longer. Um, and they're like, look, the worst thing that could happen is that you crash and burn and then it's their fault for hiring you um, with no experience. Like you've got no experience. So you've got nothing to lose. And I was like, all right. Yeah, you're right. I got nothing to lose. And I managed to not get fired. <laughs> um, and uh, and people liked the show and it they liked it enough for me to get on to Dilbert. Um, and uh, and then uh, same thing uh, at Dilbert. Like, it's kind of the same story over and over um, of me, like, trying to not get fired um, <laughs> uh, before they figure out that I'm just making it up as I go along. So I was hired as a director on Dilbert and was told that they were going to hire the supervising director from the pool of directors that they were going to hire. Uh, and they only ended up ever hiring me and one other director. I was looking at the schedule and having just done, you know, 42 half hours uh, of mummies, um, I was looking at the schedule and like, uh, if we need to actually stick to this schedule, then someone needs to start like 
actually designing characters and actually boarding the thing. So I just started boarding the script that we had, and then I ended up directing the pilot um, and uh, and then ended up being the supervising director um, and uh, and then hiring a bunch of other directors who had way more experience than I did, which, you know, was kind of how it went for me for, you know, the, the first um, bunch of years of my career, like everyone had way more experience than I was than I did. I was the young the young punk um, director who you know had the gall to um, give notes and stuff like that. It's different now because you know you know Craig and Gendy like kind of changed things with Cartoon Network and like when they were at CalArts, their whole yeah. focus was TV, uh, and so now people come out of CalArts wanting to go into TV more, and then you get you know guys like Pendleton. It's Pendleton Ward, right? Adventure Time. Uh, Pendleton Ward, yeah. Yeah, um, so you got guys like him that, you know, are coming out and, you know, just like with Craig and Gendy, you know, the, his student film becomes a series. Um, that was not my lot in life. <laughs> right. I think that most most shows that are on right now, especially the super popular ones, they're all CalArts alumni. Like, almost yeah. all of them are. When you get to my stage, um, th- this is what happens, is that you get meetings where you are meeting with that 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 guy who was basically me um, uh, way back when I first started directing, um, except for now I'm meeting with that guy because the studio doesn't trust that guy to run the show, right. but they want him to be the creative head of the show. But then they want someone like me to like, I don't know, be uh, the, uh, the grown up in the room. Um, that like gets the show actually done uh, right. on time and stuff like that. The mark of a good director too, taking everything. And even if you say that you're less experienced in one era or you're more experienced in the other, like knowing where the fault is and covering it up, I think is more important than the pomp of being like in charge as a director. Yeah. I mean, I think early on in my career, I, I just wanted to be the director because I wanted to be the director. Like I wanted to be the guy. I mean, I never, when I was in school, I never would have thought, like, I'm going to go to Deke and um, and do this um, really low-budget show. But I actually had more creative control on, on that show than on a lot of the stuff since. Well, do you prefer to, to have that free reign, or would you rather have people on your case or giving you notes or giving you guidelines? Now I would rather just have the, the free reign. Now I'm seasoned. Um, I wasn't then. I, I probably could have used a little bit more... Uh, reigning in earlier on but you know i was i was also pretty responsible i um i mean you know i had already been living on my own since 18 and fending for myself um i was also um you know a, a black belt in karate and um you know i just uh, casually <laughs> drop that into the conversation like it's nothing oh i'm just a black belt in karate well but you know it was like uh, um I, I had like a level of discipline because of that that um that maybe other people didn't have and like you know it's probably the thing that like you know when i was staying at my desk longer it's not like i was staying at my desk longer than anyone else um it, it helped yeah the focus and um it also helped with, with that show in particular because um you know it was a fighting show and so i was choreographing all these fight scenes um, in the show the, the art director was also a black belt and the storyboard supervisor was also a black belt so we had this like trio of black belts making this show about fighting mummies uh, so what you're really telling me is that to be successful in animation you've got to be a black belt must be a black belt yeah uh, i got it <laughs> at least in the in the you know in the 90s i don't know about now <laughs> well there's not a whole lot of time between like the early 90s animation of deke and then the feature eight crazy nights that you directed yeah so how did you get to that it's, it's all just luck <laughs> it's luck and being in the right place at the right time. Eight Crazy Nights was uh, at Sony and Dilbert was also at Sony. Um, and so the supervising producer um, from Dilbert um, had gotten himself attached to Eight Crazy Nights. Um, and um, and then they hired someone else to direct it. And they asked me to, to be a sequence director. The guy that they had hired to direct um, was a director from The Simpsons, who I had worked for on The Simpsons. And uh, I kept fighting being a sequence director. Um, but, but then my friends were like, dude, you're going to be a sequence director on a feature film. Like, just do it. What do you, what do you, what else are you going to do? Um, and I was a huge Sandler fan. Um, uh, he was kind of at his peak then too. Were you saying that he's not he's not about to peak? 
All that I'm saying is You're that saying everyone that has a hill? life like a mountain. And yeah, yeah. sometimes there are multiple peaks and ridges. Sometimes there are multiple peaks. They hired someone else to direct it. And then I called the supervising producer on uh, Friday. And I was like, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll be a sequence director. And I'm just thinking, like, my sequences are going to be the best. <laughs> they're going to have to let me direct the whole thing. Because they're like, these, other, these sequences are too good. We can't match it. <laughs> <laughs> I was 27 also, um, you know, I was 23 when I, when I got the show at, um, at Deke, uh, and then 25 for Dilbert and then 27 for eight crazy nights. And I was bummed that I was going to be a sequence director and such a, uh, the, the Seth of today, if I could go back in a time machine, I would kick the Seth of then's ass. But then I got a call on the following Monday. Uh, the supervising producer was like, have you gone into work yet? And I'm like, nope. Uh, he's like, okay, well, don't go into work yet because I might need you to come up to Sandler's house. Um, and I was like, uh, okay, well, uh, what what happened? And he's like, I can't, I can't really explain. I'll tell, I'll tell you later. And so I ended up going to Sandler's house that day. Uh, met Sandler and like his whole crew. And what had happened is that that director they had asked him to um, to board, just like do a, a little do some drawings from the script um, just so we can see what you're doing. And not only did he not do any drawings, um, but after they had hired him, then he said that he had this whole like wedding and honeymoon thing planned that was going to be like a month long or something like that. And uh, they were like, why didn't you tell us this when uh, we hired you? Um, uh, and then they said, you're fired. And so then uh, I, I was able to go from potential sequence director to potential director. I clicked with Sandler. Um, you know, I uh, I had a very similar sense of humor, probably mostly because uh, I, you know mimicking a lot of uh, his characters from SNL or right. and uh, he's a black belt too, so you got that. He gives a, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just we talked out of sync to each other, and then had a full on kung fu battle, and then he <laughs> said, oh, "You will direct my film." I feel like that would actually happen, though. I feel like that could have totally happened. That totally did happen. No, I actually think that um, uh, because I wore Timberlands um, uh, to go meet him, that that was the icebreaker that, you know, so footwear uh, helped me get the job, uh, I'll say. Um, But then, you know, like, um, again, like really early on uh, with Eight Crazy Nights, you know, we were just in um, a tiny uh, room above one of the sound stages on the Sony lot. And like at one point I was by myself trying to wrap my head around like, what I had just gotten myself into, because yet again, I was like, what? The worst thing that can happen is they fire me. Uh, someone called um, and was like, can someone come down here and help me? I'm bringing these poster boards up. I'm like, hey, hey yeah, I'll, I'll come help you. And so I'm helping her unload her um, her truck um, from these poster boards. And she's like, ah, so, um, so I'm sorry, I haven't met you yet. What do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm the director. Um, and she And she like went ghost white. And she was like, Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Please put that down. I, I, I did, I didn't know. And I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. It's a really hot day. I'll totally help you carry it up. I'm pretty sure she thought I was a PA. Well, it's nice to know that you're super nice. It makes me feel a lot better about reaching out to you and interviewing you. Just wait until that next movie drops and (laughs) (laughs) I've got a whole asshole streak planned. Oh, well, I wouldn't, I don't think I would freeze it like that. Oh. Asshole streak. Uh, Reign mm. of terror. Much better. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Eight Crazy Nights um, was was an amazing experience, and all the time working with Sandler was amazing. Um, and, you know, because I had kind of, like, each step was a kind of a big step um, you know, career-wise. Like, I, I thought that I was going to be doing, like, um, a live-action thing next. And, uh, you know, I started, like, only taking meetings for live-action projects, Um but like I never directed live action, um, but you know, I was still on the like, what? I just get someone to hire me and then I just do the job and not get fired. That's that's how it works. You just I think get... that is how it works a lot of the time. Yeah. Well, I couldn't I couldn't get anyone to I, actually there were a couple of um, a couple of projects that they were like, we're going we're going to go with this script. Do you want to do it? And I was like, no, I don't really like the script. Uh, and those were horrible, horrible movies that did nothing for the careers of the guys who directed them. Oh, good call. Uh, and so Kingdom Hearts was actually the the next thing after all of that. You know, I was looking for 
I, I really wanted to do like an American anime kind of a thing. Um, like I, I wanted to like not have it be like um, a film directed by committee, which, you know, eight crazy nights wasn't as long as Sandler and, and his guys were, were happy. Then I kind of got to do whatever I wanted. It was like a little bit of a dream scenario, but I was looking to do something that was more like what, you know, Miyazaki might do or something like that. And uh, so kingdom hearts seemed like the perfect thing because, you know, I love Goofy, um, and <laughs> I loved anime, um, and I was doing nothing but playing video games anyway after Eight Crazy Nights. Um, so I put, you know, Grand Theft Auto Three to the side, you know, get those motorcycle challenges finished another time, and right, uh, and then uh, I played um, Kingdom Hearts, and then you know the the script was just um, it's not like it was bad. It just it didn't read like a episode right. of Kingdom Hearts. Cowboy Bebop was was just starting to be played on Cartoon Network um, at like two in the morning. I was still up because I had no kids um, and no job, so I was I was kind of thinking that like Kingdom Hearts, like it should it should kind of be like Sora and Donald and Goofy are like in this ship, um, like out in the in the you know in the galaxies or whatever, and it's kind of like as the Heartless go to each planet, they would be alerted somehow, and then they would go to that planets um to find the key on that planet so that's what we did well here's something that i actually was wanting to ask about when you came on board because like you said they had already had it um they'd already had a plan they'd already had a script and you took a look at it and you said "Mm, no thanks i was actually wondering how much was done before you showed up like how much had they worked on before you scrapped it It it's just the script ah okay well then i think it's good that it didn't get too far before you were like "Eh." Well, I, I almost lost the job um, by going, eh. I didn't know it, but it was the, the guy who was running Disney at the time. Like, that was his uh, concept. And and he pitched the concept to the writer so that the writer would write that concept. And, like, that's where he wanted to go with the show. Um, and I was just like, you know, you've got most of the worlds that you go to, you've already had animated series that take place in those worlds. So the only way to make this feel like its own show is to, like, really have the, the main characters be, you know, Sora and Kairi and Riku. So I, I think that they even had Aladdin as um, in the in the script. So I was fired. Um, and then we're almost fired. And then I got on the phone with him and, and, you know, I was like, no disrespect. It's just, I played the game like from beginning to end. There's something really cool about this game. Um, and the script doesn't do any service to it. And I just feel like if you've got something that's really cool and a lot of people really like it, like, why would you change it? I think that what a lot of people, um, who are listening to this don't realize about Disney animation at the time too, was that they were kind of going through a situation where, um, the tween market had kind of emerged and they hadn't had, um, a huge box office hit in the theater since move on in 98. And so Mm. they were trying to, they were trying to get their footing and they were trying to appeal to that like young adult demographic while still making it like, Oh, it's not cool to like Disney classics anymore. Yeah. Um, the nostalgia factor hadn't really kicked in for millennials yet. But here's your kingdom hearts insider scoop. Uh, I was also having meetings at um, Disney feature when eight crazy nights came out or the whole like feature animation landscape. It's like I popped on the radar from out of nowhere. And, uh, so I was having meetings at all of the different studios and, you know, would have like, you know, an hour long sit down chit chat with Jeffrey Katzenberg. Um, so, you know, I, I had had quite a few meetings at um, Disney feature animation. I really wanted to take Kingdom Hearts there. Um, and I was like, this would make such an amazing feature. You've got to do this. Lilo and Stitch was um, right around that time. Um, right. And and so, like, I don't know if you remember the, the trailers for Lilo and Stitch. Um, oh, like absolutely. Stitch is in all of the different movies. And so I was like, oh, it's perfect. They're already kind of like tipping the hat to that. There's sort of like this Disney universe, and yeah, I was trying to trying to get features involved also. And I think it's also um, it was before you kind of had the mainstream market appeal of like a multi franchise connected universe. Like yeah. the Marvel Cinematic Universe hadn't happened. The DC Cinematic Universe, like they weren't concepts that people really had their head around yet. You know, if you heard that there was a Marvel movie, you're like, oh, is it going to be direct video? Because, uh, like, all of the movies, just all of the Marvel movies sucked. It was like DC was mm-hmm. making stuff and Marvel. Well, DC was making Batman. 
<laughs> Look at them now. There's new Star Wars in theaters, and and they're planning the Marvel Universe from now until the end of time. <laughs> I think that's the name of the last movie, is until the end, end of time. time. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it's and it's a Thor movie, um, and he the movie itself triggers Ragnarok. The actual Ragnarok, not in yes. the movie. In the not real, in the movie. I get it. I in the it. movie, he says the words that then triggers actual Ragnarok. And people are like, I get the title now. I yeah. get it. He said the That's thing. That's amazing. That's a burning. <laughs> you, you talked to him, and you got the new concept for the series kind of approved, and you started uh, doing storyboards and animatics and everything. During that first attempt, how much freedom did you have after that initial like conversation? They had a lot of input on the script. We recorded the script. Um, you know, a lot of times they don't record until after the board. I like to record the scripts because um, then I like to let the voice actors play a little bit sometimes in the in the booth. And then the way they say their lines helps inform me on how I'm going to draw it. Um, and uh, so we recorded first. We had to cast and, and record. But, you know, casting was... Um, you know, it's like, well, this character's in it, and this character's in it, and this character's in right. it. Right, so for classic Disney characters, you would have, like, Bill Farmer as Goofy, and yeah. Tony Anselmo as Donald, and Susan Blakesley as Maleficent. Yeah. But what people are really, really wanting to know, and I know that you've talked about this a few times, but we had a little bit of a talk about it before, um, about the original characters. What happened with them? Um, so uh, it was Haley Joel Osment was in the game, um, and uh, he wasn't available or... I forget exactly why um, we weren't just going out to him. I think that he was still, like at the time, was maybe too big for just a little pilot animatic thing. So um, there was a, an actor that had done some stand-in, sound-alike stuff for him on like Jungle Book 2 or something like that. Um, and so it was kind of like, okay, that's our guy for the Haley Joel Osment character. Um, and then with Riku and Kairi, um, I, I don't think that they're the, the ones from the game, but it was the same sort of thing. Like, it's a little bit of like the Disney machine that happens where like, you know, their, their casting director is like, well, these are the people that we should go to. And what do you think? And you're like, we've got sound alikes on deck. Yeah. So it's not like I had any say on, on who did voices and, and, you know, I'll just tell you that, you know, if anything were to happen, it would probably go down pretty much the same way. There, there is a machine part of it, um, that, you know, that they, they, they do things a certain way, and that's how they do it, and you're not going to change that. Uh, but in the booth, um, I was letting them play a little bit more than they otherwise might get to. Um, and so, like, the actress who does uh, Maleficent, um, she said one of her lines, and um, and it was, like, the most evil line in the whole thing. And then she had this huge evil laugh that she did at the end, and I was like, what was that? And I'm like come on, you can be more evil than that. And she's like, oh, I can definitely be more evil. Uh, and I was like, I would like to see evil dripping off of that mic when you're done. Go there. Um, and so she did, and it was like, Whoa! like amazing um, stuff. And she had so much fun because um, she's like, I never get to be evil. And I'm like, what do you mean you never get to be evil? You're Maleficent. And they're like, yeah, but they always want to, they always pull me back. I'm like, no, be evil. We need evil. And then I remember, um, like the kid who was, uh, who played Sora, like I, I showed up to the, um, the recording studio. Um, I'm like, I don't like a big fuss to be made. It's not like I was having people fetch me things or anything like that. Like I was waiting for us to go into the booth just like everyone else was. And I remember the kid that played Sora, um, was like, I'm playing Sora. Um, and like, I know, cause like I cast, I cast him, but, or I didn't cast <laughs> him. I was, I was in the room when he was cast. We'll say it that way. Uh, and he's like, what part are you playing? And I was like, uh, today I'll be playing the part of the director. Uh, and they're like, Oh, you're the director. Um, so Maybe that's a theme for me. I like to surprise. Yeah, is that just your life? Like, surprise, yeah. I'm the director. Yep, it's just me. So after that, um, you know, like, you need to get your radio play approved. So uh, one of the things that was different about the, the Kingdom Hearts pilot was that um, I was doing it all outside of the studio. Um, so I was... It was kind of like the first thing for my little studio. So, you know, I was doing it on all, all on my own. Like, I had the budget um, and then just sort of ran with it. Uh, <clears throat> so you did everything... 100% by yourself. 
Not 100% by myself. I had help um, uh, with some editorial and I had help with scanning um, and I had help with color. So like I didn't scan every drawing and color every drawing. Um, I had help with compositing. I did all the drawing and I did all of the the editing. So, yeah. Something interesting that happened, uh, I want to say maybe two or three years ago, was that Kevin Monroe, who has worked on um, Ratchet and Clank and Sly Cooper and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie back in 2007, um, Mm -hmm said that he wrote an episode of a Kingdom Hearts animated series for Disney that was mm. based on the Jungle Book. And mm. I didn't know if that was for you or if that was for something else that they had attempted. No, I actually, um, uh, I was just talking to um, uh, Henry Gilroy, uh, who he's the guy that he was, um, he's the executive producer on Star Wars Rebels. And he was also on the Clone Wars and, and he did a bunch of Marvel stuff. Um, and and he wrote for also, House of Mouse, everybody. He's and wrote fan. for House of Mouse, yeah. Um, <laughs> And um, and he also did a, a script. So I think that they had a bunch of people, um, you know, taking cracks at, at doing scripts for Kingdom Hearts. Um, uh, I don't think any of the other ones um, got any further than a script. Interesting. So it, it seems that like they were trying for a long time to try to figure out what to do with that property. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, I was told that, you know, at the time, I, I don't, you know, the game had only just come out. I guess it was a big enough success soon enough that they decided to go do a second one and so that's what i was told is why they didn't move forward with it because uh they didn't want to um, piss off the director um, right. of the games um and they wanted to keep the games going and and you know even then games make more money than you know animated tv series cruel fact of life well, it's it's really interesting too because when Kingdom Hearts came out, like you said, it was it was a success. Uh, success. The the branding was everywhere. You couldn't turn on on television without seeing the commercial for it. There were posters everywhere. A lot of of millennials got their start with their first PS2 game being Kingdom Hearts, uh-huh. and so it you know it really resonates anyway because we're kind of in that age of nostalgia right now. And I think that might have been partially I don't think responsible, but it was definitely something. It came out right after nine eleven. And it was kind of the uptick of everybody who experienced that kind of wanting to go back to the 90s. So I, I, I understand that it was a huge success. Disney did a lot on their own with it. Um, for a very short amount of time after it came out, they had mascot characters at Disney World. And they were promoting it a little at the parks. And they did um, mobile games by themselves. But around 2003, 2004, um, they were basically like, we trust Square Enix. So we're not going to be doing Kingdom Hearts stuff by ourselves. That might still be the case, you know. But I I also have hope that they would be into doing something because Square has also worked with, with them on, like, doing um, a Japanese manga series. And uh-huh. they work together a lot more now. I'm, I'm kind of hoping that that won't be the final nail in the coffin for a Kingdom yeah. Hearts animated series. Well, also... You know, Disney is different now than they were then, Um, you know, and with all the franchises, um, it seems like they're like the studio of franchises now. Um, So Kingdom Hearts would definitely be another franchise. Kingdom Hearts is, uh, I mean, even at the time when I was doing the the pilot, um, I was like, we could have such high production value on this show just for the fact that these stories take place um, in worlds that we've done a feature and an animated series. So, like, there's a ton of design that's already done for these worlds. That's already and, done. What would be interesting would be getting that from a different perspective, which is what it sounds like you were trying to do with the original pilot of having Sora and Riku kind of come together and have Agrabah yeah. kind of be, like, the, the battleground between them. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to hold true to the game, but not just do a, a straight retelling of the game because, you know, it just seems like it would be boring. Like, if you just did a straight, you know, one-to-one retelling of the game in a series, that maybe the people who didn't know the game and were just discovering it in the series would like that, but I think that the hardcore fans wouldn't like that because... And, you know, I was, um, you know, like I said, I was playing a lot of Grand Theft Auto. Uh, I love the idea that, um, you know, the, the story was different no matter who was playing um and so i was kind of trying to bring that into kingdom hearts that like the main story points that are in the game are also in the show um, but maybe they they happen in a different way or at a different time well i think the audiences would definitely be more open to that now because they they understand continuity changes between adaptations yeah. you know having grown up with like the harry potter movies different from the books comic books are different you're like oh they're totally doing this comic arc during this comic book movie I, right. I think people are understanding that now, and I think that they're, I think that people are happy about that. They're accepting of it. 
Um, yeah. We had a lot of questions about how you would handle all of the lore and the storytelling about all of the games in a, in a condensed series. Well, um, I would have to ingest all of it. Um, I got um, you. See. I will help you. Um, okay. And like, I get that sometimes things go like, that's a bizarre side trip that like, no one even really knows what was going on with that one. Uh, speaking in generalities, cause I don't know any of it. Um, yeah. I'd want to want to know how the universe has expanded since 14 years ago and to then, you know, do the same thing that I was planning on doing then, which is to, you know, hold true to the game, but not just do a straight retelling. I think a lot of people are really, they'd be, they're kind of nervous about the prospect, not just with you, but people have been talking for years about what, an anime or a limited run series or a movie would look like. And just over the past, you know, 14, 15 years, the series has grown so much and it can get really convoluted at times. Mm -hmm. And people kind of want to maintain the bigger aspects of the story, but keep that like intimate feeling of what's happening between the characters and their friendships. Be right. the, the forefront of what's going on. You definitely need that. Like um, if people aren't sucked into the characters, then, you know, they're not going to watch just because it looks pretty. You can't let the Disney worlds carry it either because yeah. then it's just like, we've seen this. So I yeah. totally think you were right in, in changing the, the pilot. I mean, it was kind of like, uh, I, I felt like in the, in the pilot that um, I actually wanted to have in the background of one scene, um, I wanted to have uh, Aladdin go running through, um, uh, you know, way off in the distance, like maybe you would you wouldn't even um, catch what was going on, but that the uh, one step in front of the bad guys um, song, um, oh yeah, uh, that that would be happening like over there. So it was like there would almost be some continuity, um, uh, but but this is a whole other story that's taking place in Agrabah, and I think it would be the same in kind of any world that they'd go into. That I've read some of the stuff like people freaked out that I mentioned like Star Wars and and Marvel Universe. <laughs> But um, but just like in the in the game and in the in the show, um, them like you don't have like Sora suddenly strapping on an Iron Man suit um, and flying around with Iron Man because then it becomes like the the Sora episode of Iron Man. But you know I think that you could kind of peripherally have characters that kind of like they did with Deadpool, where you know it's not like the main guys that, like everyone knows. Like if you're a comic book fan, you know who those characters are, but um, it, they're sort of like on the fringe of that universe. Um, right. So. They're guests here. You're, yeah. yeah, you're having them over for tea. It'd be cool to see, see them like, you know, in a location that is familiar from, you know, Star Wars or something like that. But like, you don't want to have them like, you know, Sora's busting out a lightsaber and taking on Darth Vader or anything like that. <laughs> well, not yet. <laughs> Right. It could happen in the game still. A lightsaber keyblade. I feel like that could happen. I feel like uh, people have been expecting that to happen ever since they bought Lucasfilm. Uh, Another thing that I kind of want to recap everybody on is that since the the storyboards have gotten so much traction, um, Seth is kind of optimistic about doing um, like a do over, a second pitch, another attempt at trying to get. A Kingdom Hearts project off the ground at Disney. That doesn't mean that it's happening. It doesn't mean that anything's confirmed. It doesn't mean that they're considering it. It doesn't mean that anything's been set in stone or even talked about. It just means that it's something that he is serious about having happen someday and hopes to happen. Can you give us any update about where you are with that? I would like to do it, um, but you know, I've had a, a couple of email back and forths, and then I, I had lunch with the guy who was running Disney when we did the pilot. Um, you know. To, kind of enlist him into the thing and he knows different people at the different networks and the person that i was emailing with um from what i understand because i just got his email from from this guy um is that uh he's the head of like all three networks good ear to bend <laughs> and that's but, another thing too like you don't know what's happening like nobody knows they could have tried doing kingdom hearts as a series yeah a thousand times between yeah. when you did it and now they could already be you know knee deep in production on something and, and who, who knows and they wouldn't let on and and also more likely they have no plans and the fact that they have no plans um it's not like they can just go like hey you know what I got this email from this guy that worked here for, um, well, actually, he didn't work here. He did this pilot on his own. But, you know, he said this Kingdom Hearts thing. We should do something with that, right? Yeah, we should do something with that. Here's a bunch of money. Just give him a of money <laughs> and let him go do the thing. Like, right. more likely, um, you know, they've already plotted out, like, the next 15 years of production. Um, and, you know, um, 
to if Kingdom Hearts isn't on the slate, um, to get it on the slate means that someone else's pet project needs to come off the slate. Uh, so who knows? It it could also be that they're like, um, you know, sitting around a, a board room table going, I don't know. What, do, you, do you got any ideas? I, yeah. I, I, what about you? Do you anything? No, no. Oh, wait, I got this thing on my phone. Hey, this guy did this. Kingdom, let's do Kingdom Hearts. Something in the works. It's already in the works or it's not going to be in the works. Um, the, the, the hard part is that, um, you know, with the Marvel universe and the star Wars universe, like they've got their giant franchises. Um, right. You know, so it's not like they're hurting for a franchise. Um, so, you know, maybe they'll, you know, revisit kingdom hearts when like, you know, yeah, five years after kingdom hearts five has come out. So let's, the bulk of the questions from the forum users are also in this next segment, which I think it's going to be our last so let's let's just put all of that aside, all of the all of the conditionary nonsense about well this could be happening you know let's just imagine for fifteen minutes that you are getting to work on the Kingdom Hearts animated series like it's been yeah. greenlit we're good to go it's happening we have a bunch of questions about what you would do in a perfect scenario where you were calling the shots and the series was happening and you got to do things your way. Okay. Talking about the hypothetical series and what you would want, who would be on your dream team as far as people who are working with you goes? I would love to have a guy like um, Steve Ahn, um, who he's directing Voltron, or like LaShawn Thomas, um, who uh, was on Boondocks uh, and then um, was on Black Dynamite, um, and he just had a, a Kickstarter for his own uh, animated anime series um called uh canon busters um go like those those are two directors that i'd love to to bring into it um just because i feel like that they they do anime way better than i do anime because <laughs> i don't really you know as far as like uh studios to do it um i mean definitely like you know mirror is um pretty awesome so i i'd want to get a place like that and you know i think people were asking about that specifically yeah, the um the avatar um you know and legend of korra like um i, I think that you know the a kingdom hearts series would definitely uh be in the vein of that i mean i i would love to keep it you know, like a 2D anime thing, you know, maybe have um, a lot of uh, CG elements, um, but uh, keep the heart of it um, 2D. Kind of like the Disney Renaissance movies when like Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast had some CGI like in the background, but it was still yeah. drawn. Yeah. I, I mean, I think cool. that it's, it's so, um, it's so much easier now to integrate. Uh, you could have more like CG backgrounds and it just doesn't draw attention to itself um, because we're so used to seeing it now. So, uh, and you know, like I'd want to keep the stories, you know, kind of with heart and spirit and darkness and uh, all of that, you know, I think is what anime is good at, um, mm -hmm. like philosophical and uh, spiritual and uh, all of that, which that might be the hardest part of all to be able to hold on to that essence of anime. I don't know if that answers the question, but <laughs> no, it totally does. Um, and going off of that stylistically, um, one of our users, I think it was Launchpad, talked about possibly having a revolving art style so that every time Sora and the gang went to a different world, they kind of the style would kind of adapt to the source material. So if it was Beauty and the Beast, the lines would be you know sharp and small and hand painted. But if it were something like Winnie the Pooh or Jungle Book, it would be more sketchy. Um, if it were Lilo and Stitch, it'd be watercolor. Uh, I think that the worlds would be that way. Um, right. I think that the like the characters you know have to look the same you know no matter what world they're in. I think that like you know Pooh uh, Pooh's world and um, all of the um, the different worlds they definitely need to feel like the the world that they are. So like, you know, the, the look would be like the look of Winnie the Pooh. Uh, but then I think like, you know, it needs to be treated a little bit so that it feels like, you know, it's kingdom hearts, what Pooh's world looks like through the kingdom hearts lens. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so like stylistically, even though the world would be different, you would still want character representation to be closer to what's going on. Yeah. with The main trio. Yeah. And, and the mood of the scene and, you know, uh, all of that. At this point, now the Kingdom Hearts series, aside from just 2D animation, they've also integrated properties that have been live action and 3D animated. Mm -hmm. So how would you tackle Would you keep that 2D or would you try to do something special for those episodes if that were to ever happen? 
it's all of all of the ifs. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think um, you know, perfect world scenario, um, except for the live action part, that might be a little little tricky to have the, the live action animation mix. That it would be the same as going into the the worlds of the other characters. Like if it's a C- CG character, it should be a CG character, and it's just that's what people from that world look like. I'd rather see um, a mix. Um, you know, I, uh, I I'd love to see. Um, a 2D character interacting with a CG character. It gets a little jarring. There are some cases where it works really well in the Kingdom Hearts series. Like, there are some cases where people are kind of like, why did they do this? Like um, Well, for example, something that did, they did really well, they included Tron um, um, in Kingdom Hearts 2, and that, that well, world is loved. It, people, yeah. because you know, it's also a mix of animation and yeah. live action. Um, but Sora, Donald, and Goofy adapted to look like that world right. anyway. They didn't keep it exactly like the movie. They had everything kind of a little anime looking, but a little CGI and a little this and a little that. And it went great. Yeah. But a not so great example, they did Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm. And it all looked, it was beautiful. But Sora, Donald, and Goofy looked cartoony. Um, yeah. They didn't change their models at all. And not only did that part clash, but the story did not differentiate enough. Uh to where it felt new and, and exciting. It just felt like a bunch of people doing uh, imitations okay. of those characters and watching it like a local theater production of it. Um, but also Kingdom Hearts 2 has a, has that pacing problem where a lot of the worlds take more from the movie's story than create their own. I think that uh, anime sometimes in general has pacing problems or, or we see it as pacing problems. That's true. In Japan, the directors have um, more say than they do here. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you know you can have a a quirky way of telling a story that people are like oh i love when they just have those long scenes where like nothing happens and you know here you've got to like get um, executives on board with that also you're you're not going to have that kind of creative freedom maybe um i'm you know doing the the grass is greener on the other side kind of a thing and and maybe he still has to deal with those kinds of uh notes and, and things like that but um, but uh, I, I've done some work for um, Asian markets, um, and I'll tell you that the the way notes are given um, in Asia are not at all like the way notes are given here. Um, uh, you know, when when a client in Asia gives you a note, um, it's it's done very respectfully, um, and it's almost like they're apologizing for giving the notes, um, and then they'll say, and and don't take the note as like this is hard and fast this is what you must do but consider the notes kind of an ongoing conversation as we work towards um you know completion of this project right and disney is not like that with their franchise no, not not only disney but no producers well, yeah um, hollywood in general yeah so yeah my, my wife is texting me <laughs> why are you still talking to them yeah. <laughs> yeah. we're almost done i promise um so a couple days ago the the Kingdom Hearts series they um they launched a world tour and they're going to cities all over the world playing orchestrated versions of the songs from the games. Um, the score is usually pretty universally like acknowledged and well loved as far as video game music goes. Um, and so a lot of people are asking if you were to do um an animated series if the music would carry over if you would have a completely new score if it was some sort of hybrid. Um, you know, just like the rest of the game. Uh, you know anything that that is really awesome like you definitely needs to also be a part of uh, the next version of the thing so you know with the pilot uh, I used a lot of music from the game and other music that sort of you know fit that same uh, feel I love the music in the game would definitely be keeping that a lot of people were asking about channels and about lengths of episodes and whatever but I feel like even though we're talking about what you would ideally do that's kind of up to Disney yeah yeah every channel has their own formats that you have to follow and links and i mean most likely it would be um 22 minute episodes and you know three act story structure and and i think you know now you could get a season arc um where you definitely couldn't get a season arc when i was doing the pilot right Uh, now because of netflix and people binge viewing um you know it seems like they get that people want a longer story yeah, it's the culture. I mean, in animation, it was harder because um, all the cartoons that we grew up with, you would have an episode where the characters went through a situation and that would be the end of the episode and a totally new thing would happen next. But now we're seeing an animation that there are character arcs, there are story arcs, there are timelines. There are things that are happening that people really appreciate. And I'm not saying that that makes it a better cartoon, but I feel like for something like Kingdom Hearts that has that 
overarching thing where all of the games are connected and everything is happening, um, an animated series would probably have to follow suit. Yeah. So do you pr- would you prefer it to be like um, a, a streaming situation where you would have the whole season bingeable, uh, or would you rather have the cranking like a episode per week situation? I mean, personally, I love that, um, you know, when Netflix drops a series that the whole thing is there and I can like, you know, gobble it up in a weekend if I want, or I can sort of pace myself and watch one each night. But, um, you know, I think that if it's going to be on a network that uh, they're definitely going to, you know, release it each week or every other week or something like on a regular schedule because, you know, it's programming for the network. And then, you know, like, ultimately, it'll end up on, you know, Netflix or Hulu or something like that. Mm-hmm. It seems like all the Disney stuff goes to Netflix. And Yeah, and they're, they're working too. a lot closer. Yeah, well, I, I heard that they were looking at buying Netflix at one point. I would not be a fan of that because uh, Netflix is a very, it, it's, it's like a, uh, an oasis in the desert for creatives. Absolutely. Uh, it's super innovative to be bought by a corporate entity that only knows. Yeah. Yeah, that would, yeah. It's yeah. going to be more of the same. I, I have a thing that um, I've been talking to Netflix about, um, and just in the meetings that we have, it's so different. And they're, they're so much more interested in the creative and the creators, and um, they really want to say yes. Um, and so they talk about, um, you know, the pathway to yes. They're definitely dream like makers because how many franchises or canceled TV shows or abandoned series have you heard of that have gotten a second life because of the demanding public and Netflix. I mean, I love them for that. Maybe they should help do kingdom hearts. If you're listening, Netflix, (laughs) you guys already have an in at Disney. Yeah. So I know that you want to expand your animation department. Think about it. People were asking about the square Enix side of things. So all the final fantasy characters that have been cameos and uh, had some important parts in the story. I imagine that they weren't at all involved uh, with the first pass and the pilot presentation. Uh, They weren't in the pilot. Um, I don't remember if it was a specific thing where they said, don't use these characters because they belong to, um, to them. It would be cool to have them in, in the series. Um, And, you know, I, I didn't really know Final Fantasy. I was aware of it because it's a thing, Um, uh, but I never played the games or anything like that. Or maybe I played one of the games for like the blink of an eye. But I remember when I saw them in the game, I was like, oh, that's so cool that like it went through that. And like not even knowing of Final Fantasy, um, the fact that like these were some characters who survived the Heartless, that's so cool. Um, so it, it would be it would be mm-hmm. uh, cool to have them. But, you know, that's probably going to be a, a big legal thing. Maybe. But, you know, I I feel like probably the biggest hurdle would be going through them anyway. So if they were to be hands on, they might as well go all the way. Right. Yeah. Um, So just closing out, what are some things that you would like to tell people who who are creative or who want to break into not even just animation, but anything um, that's super creative and they feel like they might not be best prepared for it? Um, You know, I think that uh, if it's what you want to do. Um, then you should stop putting excuses between you and doing it and just start doing it and keep adding to the amount of time that you spend each day doing that thing. Like there's all a bunch of different things that come with being a professional artist. But one of the the big things that people don't think about is that's eight hours a day of drawing. That's 40 hours a week of drawing. Get yourself to there where you can, you actually have the stamina to do 40 hours of drawing in a week. Like, and really it's not 40 hours of drawing because if you're breaking in, it really, it's like 60 hours of drawing. Um, and when you're in crunch time, it might be 90 hours. Start drawing. Don't try to make it perfect. Just try to get it finished. Kind of with anything, like you take your hobby and you increase the amount of hours you spend on your hobby until it becomes your day job. Something that I really want to thank you for um, that I've just noticed is that people have already been sending you stuff through Twitter saying, well, this is my art and this is what I feel like this should look like and this is how I've been drawing this. And you've always, from what I've been able to see, you've been giving like great, like constructive criticism and and been complimentary. Um, And I feel like not a lot of people would do that if they had a bunch of people like clamoring for their attention. Well, I don't have a bunch of people clamoring for my attention. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's the, the Twitter followers is at like 740 and probably 700 of those are Kingdom Hearts fans and the other 40 are like, you know, Facebook friends. Yeah, I was actually thinking about um, opening it up to people to um, uh, send me stuff, and you know, uh, through through Twitter, um, and you know, I can give you uh, 
140 character um, response on your thing. If you want to animate and get some feedback on your animation, or you want to draw and get some feedback on your drawings, but yeah, um, I, I have a I have a spec script here um, uh, from from Henry for one of his projects, and it doesn't have a page count, um, but I don't know, it's probably 20 pages, and um, it sits here because I've got a crazy amount of work I got to do, and um, I've got um, twin girls who um, gobble up all my free time. So uh, if I can look at something, it's this, it's the same thing as the you know the guy who looked at my portfolio um, way back when. To look at something and give someone some advice, like first of all, I don't think people actually want advice. I think that they want you to be like, that's awesome, keep going. And and so that's what I say, like that's awesome, keep going, because what you really need is encouragement. It's a it's a long road uh, to take. Um, you know, if you want to be a professional artist, and um, you know. Like there are times when I wish that I didn't come down this road because it's so hard. What if I just stayed doing construction and then I had like, I don't know, like I go to uh, martial arts tournaments every weekend and that's my hobby. Build houses nine to five and then, you know, I don't know, play video games from six to midnight. If I had taken another path where like, you know, you just have like a regular day job that you go to and uh, and you're not constantly torturing yourself with looking at like work that other people do where you're like, they're awesome. I suck. Why am I doing this? I should give up. Um, it's never going to happen. Like I still have all of the, all of the same feelings that people have when they're doing a drawing and they're putting it out there and people are like, that sucks. You should quit. Um, like they say the same thing to me. Um, uh, and I say the same thing to myself. It's a brutal, brutal business to be in. Uh, you know, the, the thing that I get all the time from people is like, oh, I wish I were creative. I wish I drew. Um, I wish I was an artist. And, and uh, I'm just like, so how about just say that you're an artist and just create, you know, because the more you do it, the easier it gets. Right. Um, and that's the hardest thing is just to do it. I mean, like, I, I will draw for 40 hours every week um, for other people. And it is still hard for me to grab my sketchbook and draw something for myself. It, it doesn't get easier. Um, I do uh, Inktober every year um, just to force myself to do a drawing a day for myself. And it's just one month. Um, and it's so hard. Like, and I fall behind and like there's other professional artists that try to do it. Um, and you fall behind and, uh, and then like, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to do three tonight and I'll catch up. And then you do three drawings. You're like, ah, oh, these suck. Uh, <laughs> and then you see what other people are doing. You're like, they're so much better. And then you, um, you know, uh, kid like Scotty Young, stop posting so many exactly, great Exactly, yeah. Jake Parker, you bastard. Why did you create this thing? Well, Seth, it was so nice to finally actually get to talk to you. I'm sorry that we went a little long. Good luck editing. Oh, I will have all kinds of fun. Don't worry. <laughs> This is going to be like a nine-part uh, interview. Well, oh, was I know, supposed just... to be recording, PJ? Ah! <laughs> Start over. <laughs> no, no, it came Can out. It came out wonderfully. Back? Thank you so much. I had a great time. I hope sure, that you enjoyed it. Too. Hey everybody, just closing out, it's Dandelion again. I definitely wanted to thank Seth Kearsley for giving us his time, and I wanted to thank Rob Carballo, who was our audio engineer, the other voice that you heard. He recorded everything and hosted it and sent it back, and he's just great. Just a quick plug for Rob, he runs an online radio station called Geek Beat Radio that you can check out at geekbeatradio.com. So check it out, especially if you like nerdy things like video games and sci-fi and honestly everything. They have a live show every week where they talk to all kinds of geeky and nerdy people, and you'll never really know who you'll run into next. Thanks to the rest of the staff at KH Insider for letting me put this thing forward. And last but not least, thanks to all of you, the forum members who sent in questions. We really couldn't have done this without you. I hope that we got in as many as possible. Like I said, hopefully this is the first of many interviews. Tweet at us at Cage Insider using the hashtag off the chain to let us know new guests that we could have in the future and also new segments that you would like us to cover. Until next time, this is Dandelion signing off. <laughs>